Welcome back to Small Caps. My name is Kerry Stevenson. And a lot of you out there have been asking us what's going on with that uranium picture out there. It's looking good, isn't it, ladies and gentlemen? And many of you will know that I recently spoke with Rick Rule, very bullish on gold, very, very bullish on uranium. So I brought to you Mr. Murray Hill. He's the managing director and CEO of Morenica Energy. They're in the uranium space. But not only that, what I want to do is I want to introduce you to Murray Hill because he also understands the bigger picture with uranium. So, Murray, great to see you. Welcome to Small Caps. Thanks, Kerry. Nice to be here. One of the things I didn't say was, ladies and gentlemen, Morenica Energy ASX code, M-E-Y. Write that down. You've all been asking me to talk to somebody in the space. Here he is. So let's kick off, Murray, with the bigger picture. So there's a lot of talk earlier in the year that uh, uranium time has come, and Rick Rule was, was very bullish on that. It's been a bit soft throughout 2020, but here we are coming towards the end of 2020, and it seems like uranium is back, back in favour. It's time to shine. Absolutely. This year was a funny year, wasn't it, in a lot of respects. Yeah. Um, COVID probably helped uranium because uh, it cut some supply off, but... As we, as we started this year, we, we thought the uranium price would move, but then the Section 232 hangover in the States delayed things a little bit. And the outcome of that was this latest, you know, strategic buying of, of uh, $150 million worth of uranium by the US just announced uh, last Friday, which obviously saw the uranium price, sorry, the uranium stock kick up on, on Monday because of that and Friday in the States. And also, you know, things like the Russian suspension agreement, the US election haven't helped. Um, you know, they've just prolong things but whilst that's occurring and the utilities are sort of waiting to sit back and work out when to buy because uh, their stocks are beginning to deplete right so they need to start buying soon um what we saw was uh, what we saw was covid inter interject interject and and what happened we we cut production the biggest uranium mine in the world cigar lake went into care of maintenance for a period of time the kazakhs uh cut production back from their um, isr fields so there's estimated to be about 60 million pound taken out of the market this year. And when you consider there's 200 million pound uh, required uh, by utilities, that's a huge deficit. And we're expecting to see that deficit continue through, you know, the next, well, so many years now, because, uh, you know, if you've got still, still a lot of mines in care and maintenance um, and others aren't incentivized to produce or become producers like ourselves because the uranium price is too low. Yeah. You can't, you can't make money. So the, the industry is not sustainable. So, we, for the industry to be sustainable and to supply uranium to these nuclear fleet that we've got around the world, and there's 442 reactors in operation and 50 odd uh, being constructed, the World Nuclear Association talking about another 320 uh, to be in operation in, within the next 20 years uh, to feed the world's growing demand for energy. Um, we really need the uranium price to move north um, to incentivise new production. So. Uh, that's why we're also bullish about it. The supply demand is compelling. The maths, as as other you know investment funds and Rick Rule say, the maths are absolutely compelling. They've never seen better maths for any commodity in the world ever. So you know we're really we're really excited about the uranium price, but we're also excited about what we've got and what we can yeah, do for shareholders. I do want to I want to talk about what you've got, but before we do, I just want to talk about that bigger picture, if you like. Because it's it's nuclear is just part of the energy mix, um, but it, it's not good. it's not the whole answer. If you can just give us a flavour, I mean, in Australia we don't we don't have it as part of the, the mix at the moment. Do you think that will ever change? I think it will. It's it's actually um, it's uh, illegal to produce um, power by nuclear in the in Australia. We have one nuclear reactor in Australia. I don't know whether you're aware of it. It's at Lucas Heights Lucas in Sydney, Heights. Yep. Uh, and it's it's for medicinal purposes. So that's okay. Right, we seem to accept that, uh, but certainly what we're seeing is is the labour used genuinely against the uranium mining uh, and liberal for it. Right, and what we're seeing is that the labour super funds are now coming out and saying we need to revisit nuclear in Australia. But you can imagine, you know, if you bought nuclear in Australia, you produced power, and the, and the comparison between Germany and France is, is a good one because France is half the power cost of Germany, which has moved towards renewables, and France is mostly on nuclear. If we could lower our power cost in Australia by half, wouldn't you attract um, manufacturing back to Australia? And we're seeing this argument now about buddy China putting a little bit of pressure on us. Uh, if we could lower the price, have low carbon emissions and get manufacturing back to Australia, I mean, oh, what a fantastic thing to do for the country. 
Yeah, Mary, and, and, and that's it. Let's just uh, let's just uh, um, unpack unpack that a little bit because I think this is really important that people will say, "Oh, nuclear power, that's bad for Fukushima, Chernobyl," but it's nothing like that because we've got new technology. You wouldn't even know these reactors are so small. The technology is so good. It's low carbon emission. <clears throat> it's lo lower cost. So ultimately, the consumer wins. Is that correct? Absolutely. And these small modular reactors, SMRs, <coughs> we, we're hearing a lot about now. Um, you know, they, they vary in, from a small size to a, a decent size. So they're built in in factories and they're and they're taken to site and put on site. So you can imagine you're sitting out in the back of you know Halls Creek and you need some power. Instead of having a diesel generator going, you put a SMR there. You got power for thirty years. No one has to touch it. I mean, and and low cost power. So there's a lot of that happening. The, what the U.S. naval fleet's got a hundred, um, hundred um, ships and submarines that are nuclear powered. Apparently, they go fifty percent faster, and they don't, they're not fueled up. They don't have to fuel up. So there's and, they, and they're uh, not putting all this crap into the into the atmosphere right. and into six, six yeah. percent of the world's oil is used by fifty three thousand commercial ships, right, sailing across the world, delivering goods or taking goods from one country to the next. Imagine if they are on nuclear power. I mean, geez, our, our waterways would be a lot cleaner, wouldn't they? So there's a lot of there's a lot of um, optionality coming up because SMRs are being um, the the funding that used to go into other uh, energy sources has now been pushed into SMRs. The US and Canada, Rolls Royce uh, in in the UK, they're all looking at SMRs because they see a, a huge future yes, for them. Just just for those that don't know, the SMRs are the small reactors. Modu small modular reactors, yeah. yeah. So modular. And you can add one to the other and keep adding them as you, as your requirement for power increases. And they can be from nominally, you know, three megawatts up to 300 plus, right? Um, I may not have got the exact numbers exactly right, but they they're, can be used anywhere. Um, so they're really quite exciting for the, for the world. Um, and you can, you know, as I say, manufactured in a, in a uh, factory and taken out to site and put well, there and away they go. Murray, why do you think that there is so much, fear and concern about the use of nuclear as a clean energy source, because that's what it is. It is, a, ladies and gentlemen, it is a clean energy source and we've got to change the narrative. Yeah, don't get me started on fear. Uh, the, the mainstream media work on fear, right? They that's do. what they do. And, yeah. and the last 12 months has demonstrated that clearly. But um, uh, the fear of, you know, the anti-nuclear movement is all about fear. Right, because they've got no, because they can't. Science says you should be having nuclear power in every country around the world, so they have to have some argument. And the argument is, let's fear, let's scare people. So as we talked just before, you know, Fukushima, they talk about it being a disaster. Well, no, the tidal wave was a disaster that killed fifteen or twenty thousand people. The Fukushima accident at at the reactor, right, it it's killed no one. Right. So where's the problem? Now you go to Chernobyl and, and some people may not like what I say now, but there's been about 24 people killed and mostly first responders to that accident. Right. And that was a disaster. That was a terrible event because it could have been stopped. It could have been prevented um, because the way it was run. Uh, it was an old style reactor. How the how the Russians ran it wasn't real good. So, but it was only 24. And there might be another 160 die from thyroid cancer uh, over the next 20 years. There's a coal mine in bloody New Zealand. What they lose? 29 in one accident. I mean, this the the loss of life due to due to carbon emissions around the world is enormous. They talk. I've seen anywhere between two and six million a year die. But you know, they talk about disasters in nuclear. They're very small accidents uh, that people just jump on and just throw the fear out there. And as far as carbon emissions, are there any from nuclear? Or no. No, you're basically just heating up water, producing steam. Steam runs through a steam turbine, produces power. So there are there are in the you know when you, if you want to be technical, when you're building a nuclear reactor, obviously you're using steel and concrete, and you, and you are there. But in any any um, construction of energy source that happens, and when you're mining it, of course there is. But in the actual process itself, it's next to none. So what know, about this should... argument about waste? Well. Waste is the wrong word. It's, it's used fuel, right? Um, and I've seen some things lately where they have, you know, a football field in, I think it was one of the uh, European countries, is there 50 years of, of used fuel, sits on a football field only a couple of metres high. Um, you go and look at the waste from, well, I shouldn't 
I shouldn't say too much about renewables, but where are those solar panels going to go, right? Where are those wind turbines going to end up? You know, there's a big, 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 big numbers of waste coming from those that are not recyclable. So what's, what's know, the waste in comparison, sorry, we've Murray? got a very... What's, what's well, the waste coming from uh, wind and solar? So the, so the blades themselves in a, in a wind farm don't last a long time and they're not recyclable. Oh. oh. So about 70% of the wind farms aren't recyclable. And then you go to, to solar. What that, those solar panels have got heavy metals in them. And but going back to the wind farms, by the way, they're full of rare earths, which are more radioactive than uranium. Right? But don't talk about that because it's not it's not fear, right? Um, so then you go back to the to the waste from from the um, solar panels. That's heavy metals in there, right? And those heavy metals are soluble. They can't put them into landfill, and nobody really knows what to do with them yet. So if we really want to talk about waste. The nuclear industry don't have a lot of waste, and the Europeans uh, are putting, uh, you know, shaft down, um, drive out, put the used fuel rods there, concrete them in, and, and they sit there for a thousand years until or more until they're, you know, there's no way, there's no uh, radiation coming from them. But uh, the industry have got a fairly good system uh, to dispose of the fuel rods, uh, whereas I don't think the renewables industry have it's got a plan yet. Uh, my last question, because I, I know we really need to talk about Mar Maranica Energy. Yeah, but yeah why are we talking about this? <laughs> well, because you know so much, <laughs> and I get so frustrated when we're not using it here in Australia. Uh, you mentioned uh, that here in Australia, if we did start to use nuclear, one, power costs would go down. Uh, two, we could uh, increase manufacturing in this country, which would be good overall for the whole uh, the economy of Australia. Um, why haven't we embraced it? At the moment, is it just a political thing or is it the general public not understanding? Political, right, is the main thing, but also the mainstream media not not informing uh, the general public. So it's very difficult for a general public to make a decision if they're just being fed fear on nuclear. They mm -hmm. just, you know, well, I've talked to many people, play golf and, you know, ride a bike and do these sorts of things. People go, oh, no, it's bloody, it's radiation. Well, no. Like, uh, as an example, our deposit in Namibia, right, the radiation level coming from our deposit is lower than the radiation coming out of your granite bench top in your kitchen. Wow. It's, lo it's lower than that prefab concrete wall in your factory. And yet we're fearful of it. So it's just a simple education process. Mm -hmm. But how, how is that going to occur? Because the mainstream media won't allow it to occur. Uh, to occur. Um, I'm starting to sound like Donald Trump, aren't I? Um, no, that's uh, all right. You know what? We'll get you. We'll get you onto these sorts of podcasts and keep talking about it and just educate people. But look, um, I'm going to bring you back on because you do. You have a wealth of knowledge, and I really think it's important that Australians do understand that it's not the boogeyman that they think it is, and yeah. uh, it's time we started to embrace it. But given all that, and as yep. I mentioned right at the start, Rick Rule has been talking to me about how he is so bullish on uranium and that the price will because of the supply demand curve um, there are going to be some very interesting um, opportunities ahead now yep. Maranica energy being one of them you've got um, uh, you've got um, exploration in Namibia as well as yep. here in Australia should yep. we start with let's talk about Namibia and uh, what you're doing up there and then I um, if we can I want to go on to you, you've got a special uh, process so let's talk Namibia first. Yep. Namibia is a great place. Uh, it's been, Rossing's been operating there since 1976, the largest open pit uranium mine. Uh, it's operated continuously for that 44 years. Um, great jurisdiction because the government is very supportive of the Namibian Uranium Association and the conduit between explorers and, and, um, and developers and, and producers and the government and, and general public uh, stakeholders. So they really uh, do a great job of promoting the industry. It's the fourth largest country by resource in the world for uranium. So, um, you know, it's got a good history. Uh, we decided to build up a ground position in Namibia for exploration uh, for paleo channels. Paleo channels are old river systems. So what happens is the uranium leaches out of the highlands over millions of years because uh, it's, in, it's in granite. It's very low grade in granite. And then it, it flows down towards the coast um, and through these old river systems, which we call paleo channels. So we've been picking up ground where paleo channels occur um, because that's what our upgrade process suits. And uh, we did that counter-cyclical. And, uh, you know, now we've, um, we've had two exploration programs. Uh, both have um, identified uranium mineralisation. The copies one, we've got a lot of good uranium hits there. 
and uh, with time we'll develop a resource on it. Pewter Beb is it's 15 times larger than Copies um, EPL. It's the, the channel we've identified, the mineralisation, it is wider than the English channel. So it's, it puts it in sort of perspective in size. And we've got the largest ground position for nuclear fuels in the country, in Namibia. So we've got a lot more EPLs to explore. And uh, this latest funding we've done uh, is, is enables us to get out there and go and do that and accelerate our exploration program. So it's pretty exciting in country, a lot of good ground, um, some, some already demonstrated with success in uranium exploration and, uh, and uh, with a lot more success to follow, we believe. And uh, yes, and for those that don't know, you've recently done a fundraising. You're well cashed up now for the next 18 months or so of exploration, drilling, etc. Uh, are there okay. any challenges? What a great position to be in. Oh, no. You know, it's been through this low uranium price cycle. You know, we, we've just raised oh. 5.4 million. And the biggest raise we had previously was 1.6 in the eight years I've been here. So oh. well supported, very well supported by shareholders and well supported by Instos and 708 investors. Um, you know, believe in, believe in what we've done. I had a call with a shareholder yesterday who jumped. He came in in the last cap raising. He really believes in what we've done and why we've done it and, and what we're going to get out of it. So, yeah, it's, it is – sorry to interrupt you, but it is exciting to have money in the bank and, and not have to go back – we don't have to go to the market next year to raise money. Yeah. Well, what and am I, I going to do? <laughs> you're going to go and find all that you're, you're going to develop the project. That's right. And, That's and exactly right. And was very happy. That's what you're going to do. Yeah, um, and, I'm a, I, and I'm a shareholder too, so I'm going to be happy. Uh, good to know, because I often say to people, you've got to have a look at the management and you've got to see whether they've got skin in the game. You have skin of, in the game. Of the 5.4 million we raised, 500,000 have come from directors and there's only three directors and, and one other executive in the office. So we we believe in the story. We believe strongly in the story. So, yeah. Okay, that's, good. That's, uh, that's a very important point to make as well. Uh, any challenges in Namibia with, I mean, I've got to bring it up, the old COVID uh, issue. Is, has that caused any issues? <laughs> Look, it did early on uh, because um, some people breached quarantine because Namibia is, is a transit country for um, landlocked, landlocked countries that transport copper uh, to the coast and into the port and out they go on the west side of, uh, of Africa to head towards Europe. So there's a lot of truck drives coming through. A few broke quarantine, uh, had a little bit of a breakout. Uh, I think it amounted to 100 or so. And then uh, well, they went, essentially went into lockdown for six weeks. It affected us a little bit because we were th three weeks of that we were planning and next expiration, so we lost about three weeks. But September the eighteenth, they come out of their um, uh, of their state of emergency uh, because they don't have job keeper in Namibia, they don't have job seeker, they don't have the government throwing money at them uh, to do nothing. So they had to do something. So they they did that, and they have to wear masks in public, uh, and they have to social distance. Uh, but I've noticed since that. I just looked at the stats the other day. They've continued to decline in number of cases. Uh, so they're in a pretty good position, actually, except they're not getting tourists in. So they're, they're hoping for tourists to start to travel back because uh, yeah. it's an important, important part of their economy. But we, we were quite fortunate. Last September, we put on a, a manager in Namibia uh, and put on a consultant geologist. So that was very good timing on our behalf uh, because we were able to continue with exploration efforts um, through the COVID period and beyond so yeah it's a very small impact on us really so okay so the news yeah. flow out of Namibia going forward will be uh getting into a resource stage is that what you're, you're looking well uh, no we'll see it copies we can go and drill a resource of copies it's going to cost us a million dollars takes three months but as i've said to people why why the uranium's not going to go anywhere uh, we're not going to develop it at the current uranium price so there's a million dollars we can go and spend on blue sky, blue sky exploration when you've got a large ground position like we have and these assets, these these project areas are upstream of known deposits, right, of paleo channel deposits. So we're, we're following back up the river, right, to, you know, and General Mining, who morphed into GenCore years ago, identified all these areas that we've picked up as prospective for uranium mineralisation, and they were going to come back to that after they uh, drilled out Langer Hiring. Unfortunately, they left the country before they did so. Well, fortunately for us, maybe, because we can go and, you know, drill or explore where they where they um, started exploring. So we think that what will happen is that we'll, we'll spend that money, right, that we, we could put into resource drilling on exploration, right, to build up. Maybe there's another 10 copies out there we haven't found yet, right? And if the uranium price goes up to 40 bucks a pound, well, let's go and chuck a million dollars into drilling. It takes us three months to drill out with one drill rig. So it's not going to be a big drill program, right, because the deepest hole we're talking about is 20 metres. 
So it's it's an easy drill program. You know, it's um, as you can see by the background. This is not where I'm sitting, by the way. Just this is a this is a copy site in Namibia, right? Look at it. How many trees do we have to clear to get to a drill site? Uh, there's not a lion going to jump out from behind a tree or a leopard. They're not there. So you know, it's 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 an easy drill program for us, and and one drill hole costs us about a thousand Australian dollars. So it's not it's not onerous, but we can just go back there, put a million dollars in it, get a get a uh, resource, do some test work with our upgrade process, and get moving with the study. So uh, the idea now is to direct that money that funds into exploration, blue sky exploration, and really find out what's there because there's a lot of exceptional potential in this area. Okay, well, um, that's, a, that's a good overview of Namibia, but you've also got some projects here in Australia, which I want to cover before we run out of time. So let's talk Australia, Northern Territory, yep. Western Australia. You yep. picked up some of these projects for, I guess. We picked them up for four cents a pound in the ground. Now, that's, I want to take you back to when I consulted to extract resources on the HUSAD project in Namibia in 2011, I think it was, or 2000, somewhere around that time, where they sold, well, the aim price was $55 a pound. So it wasn't a high uranium price. They sold this project for $4.50 per pound in the ground. Now, I'm not saying we're another extract resources. I'm not saying we're another, um, who, we've got another HUSAD. But what I'm saying is that $4.50 versus $0.04 cents a pound uh, that's disproportionate. So it's not going to take much for the uranium price to move. And these things aren't worth four cents a pound. They're worth 10, 20 times that or more. So um, that's exciting for us, but that's one side of it. That's the leverage of the uranium price. The other thing is we've got our upgrade process. We've applied to Angela. Angela deposits 31 million pound at 1300 PPM, 25 kilometers south of Alice Springs. So all the infrastructure is there, access to labor, great spot to be. The highway is just off the edge of the, the lease. Uh, the train line goes through. It's everything's there. Uh, we've it, the impediment to being uh, for it to being developed in the past has been the high acid consumption. Now yeah. the acid consumption has been about 100 to 120 kilos per ton, and at 40 cents per kilo delivered, that's equivalent to about 40 to 48 dollars worth of acid per ton of ore. That's a big number. Smart blokes like us come along and went, we can do something about this. We've we've removed 80% of the of the acid consumer out of the ore, and our acid consumption on this particular sample we tested was 104 kilos, come down to 24 kilos after we applied our smarts. So that's a huge reduction. I can't tell you what 80 80 kilos per ton times 40 cents a kilo is because uh, ASX won't allow us to tell you that, right? But if you can work it out, 80 kilos per ton times 40 cents a kilo is a, is a bloody big number we've saved in costs. So that's very exciting. So that's just an indication of what we can do with our smarts. But, so, so when you say your smarts, are you allowed to um, expand on that? Or is this like, you know, Kentucky Fried Chicken or, or <laughs> 16 well, secret herbs and spices? No, it's not quite like KFC. Uh, we do have uh, three patterns over the upgrade process, though. We developed it on the our namesake project in Namibia. Uh, it lowers the cost base for capital and operating by 50% compared to conventional. So that's a huge reduction. And what it also does, it's a beneficiation process. So, so okay. we reject the gang minerals or the minerals that don't have uranium in them based on their physical properties. Uh, right? And then we well, these ores you can't leach with acid because it's too much. Um, cal calcite in them. So what we do is remove the calcite and now you can leach them with acid. So it gives us optionality. We can reduce a concentrate of less than 5% of the mass, very high grade uranium, and we can either leach it and refine it on site, which means you know, need capital. It's a little bit harder process to, to um, uh, commission. Or we can take that concentrate, upgrade concentrate, we can take it to someone like Rossing, right? And put it in there, they can leach it. So then we don't have to build a leach. So we don't have to build a reagent corridor we don't have to build a tailing stand. We don't have to build a refinery. Um, so we can just take it somewhere else. So what that means is that we can uh, develop smaller deposits, lower grade deposits compared to anybody else, right? So our cost base is significantly less for that same grade that someone else has got in Namibia for these paleo channel style ores. So it's very exciting. So the three patterns cover the whole process and then parts thereof. So we have just signed, well, okay, this is what we've got on in Namibia and it works on those ores. It works on the Australian ores, the calcrete ores. Angela doesn't fit in that category, but we've just demonstrated that we can go and apply this to ores outside of what this was developed for and add huge value to it. So it, it means that we can, we can look at applying upgrade or part thereof to other projects that we didn't expect we could before. 
And that's just in the uranium commodity. Who knows what we can do in other commodities? Well, we that's what I was going there yet. I was just about to say two things. One, would it apply to other commodities? Two, would you look at potentially down the track hiving that off as a sort of a technology arm of Maranica Energy? Well, you could. There's a lot of things you could look at, but just how exciting is it to be in uranium now and with a lot of projects we've got and the expected rise in the uranium price. Uh, we're just so focused on uranium now with our team uh, and, and we know what we can do with uranium. So let's just keep moving down that path. We think we're going to add a huge amount of value to shareholders uh, through application and upgrade on these assets. And these assets in Australia and Namibia are high, grade, high value assets in their own right. But you go and add upgrade to it, it just takes them to the next level. So we're very excited about what we've got. We're very excited about what's ahead of us um, in, in what, we, what we can control and then what we can't control. What we can't control is uranium price. And we've just talked about how good that could be. Uh, how good that could be. Well, what I'd like to ask as we wind up here, Murray, is you know, there are people sitting up and taking notice of all the different uranium stocks and uh, scratching their heads and saying, which one, which one? Um, why are you the best kid on the dance floor right now? Yeah, well, we've, we've got a huge land position in Namibia, the largest. Uh, we've got two exploration programs we've had on two EPLs, both of it uranium, right? So we're at 100% success rate so far. We've got another 10 um, EPLs that we need to explore. This money we've just raised enables us to go and do that. Uh, and we, we know that from when General Mining explored there, there, there is uranium there. We just have to go and find it and prove that it's a, it's a substantial quantity of it. And then with the assets we've got in Australia, we bought them for a song, absolute song. We know they're not going to be worth four cents a pound. And when the uranium price doubles, right, the uranium price has to triple to incentivise new production. So that's very exciting. But also we've demonstrated what we can do on Angela. So we've really built this, built this business kind of cyclical. We've got a solid base to work off. Right, and we have got huge leverage to uranium price, and we've got fantastic blue sky potential from exploration and what we can do with upgrade. And nobody else has got upgrade, so we can reduce cost by fifty percent compared to anybody else with the same ore in this same jurisdiction. I think that's what makes you a little bit of standout on the dance floor, there, Murray. It's that fifty percent reduction in cost. It's a bit of a standout, game changer for the yep. company. Absolutely. Thank, uh, don't forget, ladies and gentlemen, the ASX code is MEY. And also don't forget, do your own research. Uh, this is educational for you. Uh, Murray Hill from Marenica Energy. Thanks for talking with Small Caps today. Thanks, Kerry. I enjoyed it. And thanks for the dance. <laughs>